Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for taking your personal time to be with us today at this symposium. My name is Alberto Cortez Ladino. I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a psycho oncologist, and I work at Mount Sinai Cancer Center. We basically work with cancer patients, not only from the psycho oncology point of view, but also we manage pain and we do palliative care, which is uh, basically inherent to the, to the profession. Today, I'm going to talk about the most common symptoms that a patient with cancer develops. Here, the title uh, calls it fear, anxiety, and depression. And you're going to know, you're going to learn that this is combined. These symptoms never present uh, isolated. No special disclosures. This is going to be a very short presentation. <laughs> and my goal is that for those who are not familiar with what a psych oncologist do, basically after this lecture, you're going to be aware of what type of services are available for your patients and what type of treatments use, we use for, for them. Talking about psych oncology is like drinking from a fire hose, but I'm going to try to give you a good summary of the symptoms. Psychological and social issues related to cancer were actually not actively studied until about three decades ago. And this aspect is particularly poignant, especially when one recognizes that each advance, as you can see, each advance made by, made by oncologists in treatment methods also develop created side effects and problems with which the patients had to cope. That's why the need for a psychosocial service was, uh, was created. What is psychoncology? Basically, we work in the psychological, the social, the behavioral, and the ethical parts of cancer. Basically, in two perspectives. One is the patient's responses to all these aspects, psychological, social, behavioral, and ethical, and related in regarding to the disease process of the cancer itself at all stages, not only end stages of the cancer, but also while the patient is receiving treatment, also when the patient was initially diagnosed, and the morbidity and mortality related to those, to those processes. Even though the first anti-cancer agent was developed in the 1940s, it wasn't until the mid-60s when we started to see children surviving of, from um, Hodgkin's disease and leukemia. All those uh, changes in medicine increase the mortality, incre uh, increase the survival, decrease the mortality. Most of those uh, cancers were cured. But despite all these advances, we saw that some worries were triggered, triggered also. And the most common was the fear of recurrence, the psychological distress. The patient is already a survivor after these wonderful treatments. But guess what? The fear of recurrence became the sword of Damocles, threatening the patient every single moment of the life to, to hit on the head. We see patients in our clinic telling us, every time I have a headache, the first thing that comes to mind is that, is it a metastasis? I have a brain metastasis? If the patient has, let's say, gastrointestinal symptoms, diarrhea, is it recurrence of my cancer? Is it metastasis? The patient has bone pain. Guess what? It's metastasis. One of the things that we do is to help the patients not only cope, but to develop strategies 
and to develop uh, tools to live with this fear of recurrence and actually to control this fear of recurrence. It's easy to tell the patient, you need to, to be positive, to have positive thoughts. That's a little bit more difficult than that. The patient has to develop tools. It's just like riding a bike. At the beginning, the person falls, the patient comes back, the patient falls back again. And after a while, the, patient, the person riding a bike is not only to maintain the balance, but also to enjoy the weather and also to be aware of the dangers around. This is exactly the same process. We accompany the patients in this process. <coughs> the, according to the studies, the, higher fear, the highest fear of recurrence is presented in patients with breast cancer, patients after a bone marrow transplant, and can be as low as 5% in patients with testicular cancer. There are some other problems that were developed, and is the long-term consequences and the psychological impact of injuries to the body. Mastectomies, the patient, the body image of the patient. Chemotherapy-induced alopecia according to the studies, is one of the top three most devastating side effects of the chemotherapy. And guess what? According to the oncologist, it's not even top 10. So we need to help to, to, to be on, on the same page in this setting because this is something, as you can see here, this is something that can be prevented. And these uh, mechanisms, these uh, tools can decrease the chemotherapy-induced alopecia by 75% easily. We have the, those um, uh, tools at Sinai also available for our patients. The most common can, uh, symptoms in cancer patients are basically fatigue in almost every patient. Pain is also a very common symptom. Cancer cachexia, some people call it anorexia, but it has nothing to do with anorexia. It's called cachexia insomnia and delirium. I put depression and anxiety together because you will never see a patient suffering from anxiety without symptoms of depression. Let's talk a little bit about pain. Pain is very common, especially in bone, either primary bone cancer or metastasis to bone. It's also very common in a GI, gastrointestinal, uh, GU and lung cancers, and patients with leukemia, the prevalence of pain is actually very low. I couldn't talk about pain without talking, uh, giving a few minutes to the epidemic of opioid abuse. Since year 2000, this epidemic has increased by 200%. And look at the numbers, only in 2016, more than 42,000 people died of, of uh, problems related with opioid overdose to the point that as of today, opioid abuse and opioid uh, related deaths became the first, became the leading cause of accidental deaths in the in United States. We recommend to to the staff, to our residents, to follow the analgesic ladder when we're managing pain. Start with non-opioids, and we're talking about cancer patients. Start with non-opioids. Sometimes good combinations of non-opioids can be very helpful, especially in early stages. Uh, which one, sorry? No, non-opioids are the first, the, the baseline. Yeah, the first line, always. Then you combine those non-opioids, and then you start using opioids, low-potency opioids, like oxycodone, tramadol, all those things, in combination with the previous level, meaning uh, diclofenac, 
Tylenol. Tylenol is, is uh, very useful in combination of, uh, with these medications. How these opioids work? We have basically three, the most common three receptors, opioid receptors are the mu, kappa, and delta. And opioids alter the nociceptive information. Nociceptive is basically the, the normal information, the normal transport of information of the pain, and also blocks the circuits. That's why we may feel, we may have the, the injury, but we don't feel the pain because it's blocked in different, in different areas. The medications that block these three receptors, mu, kappa, and delta, depending on where they bind, can be called agonist, partial agonist, or antagonist. For instance, naloxone. Naloxone is a non-selective and blocks every single uh, receptor, but has some, some uh, preference for the mu receptor. And buprenorphine is called a partial agonist because it's a little bit of uh, agonist on the mu receptor, but it's a strong blocker of the kappa and delta receptors. We used to believe that the receptors were located on the surface of the neuron. And last year, they found through these uh, studies from Stober that the opioids that we give, not the opioids that we develop, that we produce in the brain, but that we give, the morphine, the oxycodone, all those, are actually not gonna be attached to a receptor on the surface, but are gonna be inside of the neuron. That has changed uh, basically the game in the, the way we see the, the opioids in terms of the, of the kinetics and the dynamics. They are different receptors. A word about methadone. Methadone is commonly used not only as a drug of abuse, but also to treat uh, problems of uh, dependence and, and, uh, and pain. It's, a, it's an agonist, opioid agonist, but what is the problem with that? Because it has a long elimination half-life. In a short analgesic half-life, this medication becomes very dangerous to manage. <coughs> when you want to switch an opioid, a regular opioid, and start using methadone, please decrease the um, equi-analgesic dose by 75 or 90 percent and never give more than 40 percent, not even in advanced, ca in advanced uh, cases of cancer. Please. So, I'm sorry to keep interrupting. So, let me get this right. So, you are utilizing methadone in treatment for cancer patients? If we need it, absolutely. If we, if we need it, absolutely. We try not to because it's a dangerous medication. It's difficult to manage. But if uh, the situation merits, absolutely. Mm, not really. I, what I believe is that you need a special uh, permit for buprenorphine, but for methadone, no. I'm not aware of, at least I, I haven't had any problems prescribing methadone. Pleasure. How we recommend to prescribe opioids? Please don't use long-acting opioids in acute pain. And please give, if, you, if you're forced to give opioids, give the lowest possible dose and for the shortest period of time, three days or less, never more than seven days. You need to test the patients, yes. If it's a non-cancer patient, because usually cancer patients are more responsible in terms of the, the opioid use, but in non-cancer patients, and if you need to give the medication for more than six weeks, yes, please, get Utox. And also these um, monitoring programs are extremely, extremely important. That actually seems to, to reduce a little bit the mortality and the, the um, dark use that some patients give to the opioids. How often you have to reassess the use of opioids? If you have to give more than 50 morphine 
um, uh, equivalent dose, milligrams equivalent, equi equivalent dose, and never give more than 90 equivalents. You're going to ask me, but how? There are some strategies, and the most common and effective strategy is please rotate the opioids. Never give the same opioid for three months, five months, six months, because the patient is going to start developing tolerance. So what you have to do is give eight weeks, ten weeks of the medication, and rotate with equivalent medication. What's going to happen? The brain is going to take the first medication after 12 weeks as a brand new medication, as a brand new opioid. And that way, we're not going to increase the risk of tolerance and dependence on the opioids. We use the e -forks. Actually, our health record system, EPIC, doesn't let us prescribe, finish the prescription of controlled substances until we review e -forks. And that is helping us a lot. Antidepressant nation, this is a very good term. Some epidemiological and experimental studies have shown the association between depression and chronic pain. And we have recognized the advantages of some of these antidepressants in uh, treatment of, um, of pain. For instance, the tricyclics in neuropathic, look at the improvement. In the case of Cymbalta for neuropathic myofascial in patients with diabetes, Effexor has been proven to be helpful in patients with diabetes. Celexa and Paxil in neuropathic pain is a, is a very interesting thing. However, most recent studies, studies from the last four years, is a type of study called pain path analysis have shown that at least, and this is fascinating, at least 80% of the changes in the way we perceive pain and depression is not due to the pain medication. The perception is due to the antidepressant medication. Why? Because antidepressants medic antidepressant medication have anti-pain effects and is a different attack the pain in a different way. It's not because the patient is feeling better from the depression that the pain is more tolerable. No, the, the antidepressants also have analgesic eff uh, effects. And this is the proof. This wonderful study from the Japanese group showed that patients with depression share a lot of, uh, a lot of abnormalities with patients suffering from chronic pain, especially, uh, specifically cancer pain. You see that the images are very, very similar. The um, alteration is seen in the amygdala, the thalamus, the prefrontal cortex. But there's one, one specific area that has called the attention of the researchers in, in this sense, and it's called the anterior is the same half. The anterior cingulate area and the main difference between depression and chronic pain is mainly in the area of the uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. There are a different approaches to pain depending on the culture. I'm not going to show you this video because it's a little bit long, but basically the doctor of the community was hitting the patient. It appeared to be uh, laughable, but guess what? It has a biological uh, principle behind this. Don't forget that pain can mask another pain. This person was hitting the other one, and the pain here basically distracted the pain, distracted from the other type of pain. We use also a lot of um, Botox for um, um, trigeminal neuralgias, for chronic headaches, and uh, other different uh, areas of the body that are affected. Let's talk about cancer cachexia. It's different from anorexia. 
because anorexia means that there's aversion for food. In cachexia, the problem is not the patient has the psychological component, is that the metabolism of the patient is different. In normal situations like pregnancy or exercise, and in cases of um, hyperthyroidism, the metabolism is fast because of the requirements that are coupled with the intake of food. In the case of cancer cachexia, the problem is that the metabolism uses, and I'm going to show you in, on this slide, doesn't use the regular gluconeogenesis, the, the, the energy producing uh, metabolism parts, jumps directly to burn fat. And burning fat is an extremely expensive, from the metabolic point of view, it's an extremely um, expensive process. That produces a lot of, um, an increased protein kinase A. That's why patients lose weight. From a study, a presentation on the, the Cachexia Society in Washington in uh, two years ago, they showed that 62% of the cancer patients going to their first oncological visit, they already have cancer cachexia. The most common, obviously, has to be related to pancreatic cancer, gastroesophageal, and lung cancer. And the lowest prevalence of this type of um, metabolism uh, abnormality is seen in breast cancer. The treatment has been tried. Steroids, megase, antidepressants like uh, mirtazapine, nutritional supplements, cyproheptadine, all those, um, all those treatments at some point can be combined to help the patient. Nausea and vomiting is another very common symptom in cancer patients. We see that this nausea and vomiting is basically triggered after the stimulation of any of these four, uh, four areas. The central nervous system, the highest uh, centers, the vestibular system, the chemoreceptor area, which is basically located on the floor or the fourth ventricle, and the vomiting center, which is located a, a little bit um, down from that, uh, from the floor of the, of the fourth ventricle. And that is formed by the medulla oblongata and, um, and the chemoreceptor zone. What is the treatment for that? We use a lot of medications, including ondansetron. Ondansetron blocks the um, serotonin-3 receptor located in the vomiting center that we just saw. But I want to mention the um, seminal work of one of my professors, Steve Pasek at Sloan Kettering, who did the biggest study on olanzapine in cancer patients. He found that olanzapine was actually wonderful medication for our cancer patients because of the side effects. Most of the medications that we know act in one receptor. Olanzapine works in six different receptors. So this is a medication that is a mood stabilizer, helps the patient to sleep, stimulates appetite, is not very good, but can help a little bit with pain, and it's possible that olanzapine is superior to ondansetron and the other anti nausea medications. So it's a, it's a very good option that we have to consider. Downside of that, we have to monitor the heart, because just like any other antipsychotic medication, or most of the antidepressants medications, these, there is the risk of increasing the QTC. And a QTC prolongation may be uh, a, very, a very dangerous situation for, for, for a patient. Cancer-related fatigue. This is a very interesting concept because sometimes the patient presents to your clinic telling you, I'm depressed. Cancer-related fatigue is actually more common than depression in the setting of cancer because the symptoms 
of cancer-related fatigue and depression overlap. And this is related to what we just mentioned. Cancer itself is a hypermetabolic state that obviously produces severe fatigue. The patient feels exhausted and is not going to get better with rest. The treatment for cancer-related fatigue is also um, but very, very extensive. And there's only one medication that we could never, never um, give for these patients. It's called paroxetine. Studies have shown that actually paroxetine is the only antidepressant that worsens the fatigue. We use a lot of stimulants, Ritalin, amphetamines. Amongst the antidepressants, the list is basically reduced to two antidepressants. One is bupropion, the other one is Effexor. Those are the two antidepressants that have an activating properties. So we give these patients these medications early in the morning to give a boost of energy. What is the downside? Since it's a, sti a stimulating medication, it may worsen the, the appetite. So be careful with that. Modafinil is also um, very used and it's a very safe medication in that sense. Not too long ago, the FDA approved TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, to treat these symptoms of depression, anxiety, uh, panic disorders. And it's a wonderful option also for our cancer patients. Basically, we do a mapping in the left prefrontal area with a magnet. When we see a response that is not exactly a seizure, just the movement of the thumb, that's the area, the left prefrontal cortex, that's the area where, the, the, as we saw in, a, in the, the previous slide, where the depression and the anxiety and all those symptoms can be controlled better. The FDA approved three months ago a protocol in which you need to use the magnet only for three minutes. The initial protocols required 30 minutes. After that, it was dec decreased to 18 minutes, and now it's only three minutes. You have to give it five times a week for four weeks. And uh, we're going to reduce a lot of the use of medication and the side effects. So this is a safe option that I'm glad to say that Mount Sinai is going to be the first cancer center on the East Coast um, where this treatment is going to be uh, used for, for our cancer patients, and the second in the country. What's the efficacy on that? The efficacy is better than the antidepressant medication, and is close to 85%. <laughs> I'm going to talk briefly about CBD. The next uh, lecture, Dr. Kuzner is going is to uh, talk more about, about this uh, cannabis system. But I just want to present you this option. And I found few well-done studies to present you today for anxiety and depression. This study showed that when combined Prozac plus CBD oil at ineffective doses, there was good antidepressant effect. And then when they give, gave the, the uh, animal model the PCPA, which is an inhibitor of the serotonin, the CBA, CBD couldn't, couldn't act. That uh, is a, a very good um, proof that uh, the effects of the CBD in depression are also related to the serotonin system. In the case of anxiety, this is the only double-blind study that I found was a group from Brazil, from um, Albert Einstein in Sao Paulo. They used, they gave to the patients, actual patients, 400 milligrams of, of CBD or placebo. The patients presented decrease in the, the tools that they used for, to measure anxiety. But the way they approached this study was with imaging. And they found that after the patient got the CBD, 
the flow, the cerebral flow pattern was, uh, was improved as an anti-anxiety effect of the CBD, which didn't happen in the, with the placebo. Delirium. Delirium is one of the most common mental disorders encountered in the hospital, especially in our cancer patients because of the um, uh, medical complications. Delirium can be produced by multiple sources at the same time. Can be infection, can be side effects of the medications, can be interactions between medications, can be metabolic um, problems. And the most important key here is that delirium is reversible. If the patient didn't recover, the cognitive function was not delirium, was something else. And it, it is present in about 85% of terminally ill cancer patients in the hospital setting. This is a personal favorite. This is Salvador Dali made a drawing on a serviette of Professor Freud when he was waiting for him at his house in North London. And after the meeting, Professor Freud said about Salvador Dali, now I understand why the Spanish live in a civil wars. Thank you so much. Please. What about lamentor? Uh, intimated that you have this, you know, mood stabilizer is very helpful. Is lamentor helpful or not at all? Lamictal is extremely helpful in controlling, in, 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 uh, is, sorry, is very helpful in a neuropathic pain. For instance, when the patient has uh, spinal stenosis due to metastasis and, the, and develops this uh, excruciating pain, neuropathic pain, the lamictal, starting at very low doses, 25 milligrams twice a day, can be helpful, and that can be increased to 100 milligrams twice a day. But what is the downside of lamictal? Lamictal, one, produces somnolence, so in older patients, may increase the risk of falls. We don't want that. And second, a lo no, no, a higher doses, and also, there are some uh, anaphylactic idiosyncratic reactions to this medication. That's why we need to start at the lowest possible dose of 25 milligrams. Pleasure. Any other questions, please? By a who? Uh, can be a psychiatrist, can be a trained physician. Please. So if, if I'm a cancer patient and I go to your office, mm -hmm. Uh, could you be more specific? Well, like, do you do CBT, do you do guided visualization? What do you do? Because you seem very the, the, main, the, the main type of therapy that we provide at our hospital in the, cancer, in the cancer setting is obviously cognitive behavioral therapy because this is a type of therapy that the patient needs to make conscious and at the same time to redirect the behavior in terms of for instance, fear of recurrence. What we do is, I'm going to give you an example. The patient comes to my office and tells me, I'm afraid that I have a recurrence of my cancer, that I have metastasis. My first question is, what have you told by Dr. Kuzner? Because no matter what, no matter how advanced, no matter how um, early is the illness, we cannot work with the patients unless it's not based on reality. So the evidence that we use is the recommendations and the evidence provided by the, by the, oncolo by the oncologist and the team. Because what if it's true? Yes, Dr. Kuzner told me that I have metastasis. Okay, so it's a, it's a fact that you have metastasis. Now let's work on the next step. It's very important, your question, because 
few days ago I read a forum and there was a psychiatrist in Europe saying there's no hope if the cancer is advanced. I'm going to tell you one thing. There's always hope. It doesn't matter if, he's the, if the patient was just diagnosed or if the patient only has few hours to live. There's also hope at this moment. The hope changes. What is the hope at this stage? The hope is that the patient dies in no pain, not suffering, surrounded by the loved ones. That is also hope. It's not only the hope that, that sometimes is provided to the patients at the early stages of the, of the cure. There's always hope. Thank you so much.